So we're going to start the set with today. We've got Stephanie Smith and Caroline Davison, uh, and then Padstow, the visit to Padstow. Uh, the coaches for Padstow will be leaving in about half an hour. We'd like to form an orderly queue outside. So Stephanie, can we go over to you and uh, see what happens when you share your screen? <laughs> yes, yes. Keep your fingers crossed, everybody. Okay. Right. We can see that. Good. Um, so we'll we'll see that this is a little more complicated because there's a lot of coordination involved. So we'll see how I do. Um, before getting into the background and resources of the uh, Ralph Rensler Folklife Archives and Collections at the Smithsonian, I wanted to say a bit about the larger context of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, it is the world's largest museum, education, and research complex. It has 19 museums and galleries, 21 libraries, nine research centers, including the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, and the National Zoo, mostly in Washington, D.C. Many of these units have collections ranging between books, natural history specimens, zoo animals, stamps, archival collections, airplanes, audiovisual collections, art collections, material culture, and so forth, just to name some examples. Um, the Rinsler archives, which were not called that until quite a bit later, and the center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage date back to the beginnings of the Festival of American Folklife in 1967, largely through the organizing efforts of Ralph Winsler. I can only mention a few nuggets from Ralph's fascinating life, but refer you to an article on his professional biography, which is on the sheet that um, Martin shared with you. Uh, Ralph was connected to, to, to traditional music and lots of the right people from a young age. He met members of the Seeger family at the Swarthmore Folk Festival while, where he was attending college. Mike Seeger taught him some fieldwork techniques. He went to England in 1957, connected with Peggy Seeger, who introduced Stephanie, him. Stephanie, Stephanie, yes. um, are, you, are you moving the slides on? Um, I'm not You're ready. Not the, okay. There are only a few slides. Yeah, I was just checking because sometimes yes, they don't no, move I, on. That's no, fine. It's, don't worry about it. Fine, carry on. Um, he, okay, uh, he, uh, through Peggy, he met um, Ewan McCall, Alan Lomax, and others. He did field work in the Irish pubs of Camden Town that ended up on a Folkways record. He worked as an accompanist for Bert Lloyd and McCall, among others. He returned to the U.S. in 1959, where he proceeded to do things such as finding Doc Watson near Boone, North Carolina, and helping him to gain a national audience. Hired as a field worker and talent scout for the Newport Folk Festival in 1962, Ralph was able to do musical field work that led him to the importance of material, material culture as part of the bigger picture. Doc Watson and other traditional singers whom Ralph had found performed at Newport. In 1966, the Smithsonian asked him to come to Washington to discuss the establishment of a folk festival. It began in 1967 as the Festival of American Folklife and included not only musicians and performers, but material culture. Here's uh, a photograph of the 1973 festival. Um, it, this was the Kentucky program. You can see this is a 
tobacco barn and behind the barn is real tobacco growing. And it's set up as a stage area as well. So these were fairly extensive. Um, I don't see the slides moving no, on. Steph Stephanie, Stephanie the, the slides haven't moved on. Really? Okay. Yeah, we've still got your um, title page at the beginning. Okay. Still, All right. Still for play. Play your. Uh, no, actually, I'm. Play from the start. That's better. Right. Forgetting that, but not full screen. Okay. I, yeah, I. Dave, go up to slide, Joe, and then click play from start. Joe, yeah, are you seeing a new slide? We, no. We've got we've got the barn, but uh, Stephanie, so, you are not you are not in slideshow mode. You're on the uh, Ed, well, my the, I am on my laptop, so not, I think not, you need to set to play. Yeah, play let, from start. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please be quiet and leave it to Martin. <laughs> One voice at a time. Okay. Now, if I advance, do you see Ralph Rensler? No, I think you need to go out and start again. Yeah, I, that's what I think I need to do. Uh, check that you're selecting the right window. No, I did that. I had it in play mode, which is why I may have had a problem. Um, Try again. Okay, now do you see Ralph Rensler? No, we've still got the bar. In design view. Try play from start again. Ah, now we've got Ralph Rensler recording. Um, okay, but you're seeing my, you're seeing my the the slideshow software yes. yeah um, but, but we can see the middle bit quite well so you can as long as it moves on we can manage with that. yeah no it, i'm sorry i'll just i'll just do it from here um here is the kentucky barn yeah we have the barn okay and um Okay, and here is an iconic shot um, from the festival, maybe 1976. It's, it's people seated on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and then uh, the festival continues to this day. And here is a shot from 2018. It was the Catalonia program. And you see on the right-hand side, Ralph Rensler's stage with the Smithsonian Castle behind it. And this is on the National Mall, adjacent to various Smithsonian museums. Um, a center with ever-changing names was thus established for research, publication, and presentation of folk life programs for the Folklife Festival. Ralph became Assistant Secretary for Public Service in 1983, which he thought would, be, would better enable him to achieve his cultural goals. Um, he successfully wooed Moses Ash of Folkways Records, then in ill health, to sell the iconic record label to the Smithsonian and it arrived after Ash's death in 1987. Uh, you can see this is actually just a shot of part of the um, early record labels that Moses Ash had prior to Folkways. So um, you can see Ash and the numbers for the, for the recordings. It just gives you a sense of the space in, in the archives, which is all changed because we put in new shelving. But anyway, um, this was a, a transformative acquisition for the center. Um, 
Ralph, Ralph died during the 1994 festival, leaving a huge legacy. Everything Ralph did in his life is reflected in the scope, philosophy, and outreach of the center. Um, the business papers and media in folkways now named the Moses and Francis Ash Collection has been inscribed to UNESCO's Memory of the World International Register. It is the first music related collection from the United States to be so inscribed. I consider that the festival collection and the ash collections are the two most important and larger collections in the Rinsler archives. Although Ralph Rinsler's papers and audio recordings is a very significant collection. Smithsonian Folkways began to acquire other folk related labels and record label acquisition continues today. Um, and other collections were donated to the archives from the 1990s onwards, such as the Lee Hayes papers and Diana Davies photographs. Um, I'm actually going to, no, I'm going to skip uh, ahead to um, showing you some of the collections websites. Um, So can you see the Moses and Francis Ash collection? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so what you're seeing is you've got two tabs on the left, overview and contents. And if you look at the bottom of all that, it says print PDF finding aid and show EAD, which is encoded archival description. Um, what is most useful for most people is if you click the contents and what you see are the actual folders in the collection. And when you see the little blue box, it means that there's digitized content available. Um, and you can limit, you can limit to digital only if you so wish. But um, I'm just going to show you, if you open correspondence, then you see how you can, you can search the names. Um, and let's see. I'm going to come down here to Sydney Cowell. And you've kind of got to open these folders up and just see what's in them to really um, know. But then when I click on the folder, it opens up and shows me various things in that particular folder. And then there's another page. Um, so here we're looking at a letter from Mrs. Henry Cowell to Moses Ash. Um, and they clearly had a very close correspondence relationship. There are lots of, of interesting little tidbits here. Um, you can expand the page uh, uh, if you can't read it. Um, and here's a little um, note that she sent to Mo um, in 1974. So that's, that's one way you, you can look at things. Um, when you get into these, um, you will X out of that slideshow because it doesn't come back to this original page. Um, you can search here within the collection for specific things. 
I'm going to come back out and just show you briefly um, the production files are also a rich source of material and they are listed by the recording number and so and and the numbering for folkways records was really idiosyncratic um, uh, so you just have to scroll through but if you want to see the papers about a specific recording you can go into that recording and uh, see well that this doesn't have a this does not have uh, digital content, but many of them do. Um, so, and let's see. Okay, so I'm searching for Diana Davies photographs. Um, and that shows me um, uh, the, this is the, the main page for Diana Davies. Um, and Again, I will come over here to contents. These are photographs, um, but they are, she was everywhere. She took amazing photographs. Um, she took photos of Bob Dylan at Newport when he went electric. Um, she was at Newport and the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Folk Festival. And I'm just going to scroll down to, um, here's a page, all the contact sheets, black and white contact sheets of her work are digitized and in here. Um, and you can click on this and it brings up the contact sheet. And there is Norman Kennedy, Doc Watson, Sarah Cleveland, uh, Joe Heaney, um, and the young tradition. So uh, this is a really important resource for photographs. And since my time is undoubtedly running extremely short, I'm going to show you this website, which is it's a collection search that covers the whole institution. So there's a lot of different stuff in here. And if you wanted to search, uh, okay, let's search Almeida Riddle. And you notice you get this sort of hodgepodge of stuff, um, recordings um, and so forth. But notice on the left-hand side, you can narrow by um, type. So you can narrow by archival material, sound recordings, all these different formats. And you can also narrow by catalog record source and you see Ralph Winsor Folk Life Archives. Um, uh, but, but, but this allows you to sort of navigate and find what you want. Um, I'm gonna select that. And we still have the recordings, but then farther down, um, 
it's showing that she appears in archival materials that are in the Rinsler papers. Um, so it's, this gives you information. This data is drawn from old DBase. We had a DBase database in the olden days, and then it was migrated to Access. And so the Access database was migrated into an institutional system and then into this larger thing um, because there are so many different collection systems in the Smithsonian. But um, it allows people to find individual holdings, audio holdings. Um, here, here we go, we've got Rinsler field work, um, the Lone Pilgrim performed by Hobart Smith and Al Almeida Riddle. Um, so <clears throat> I might add just while I think of it, Ralph did extensive field work in Cape Breton and possibly other parts of Canada, but um, I actually had someone from Cape Breton find something in here of his from Cape Breton and she contacted us because she wanted a copy of the recording because it would capture um, the Gaelic spoken in Lewis at the time that they em emigrated to Cape Breton and she wanted to share this with her granddaughter. So, um, this is a much more, I'm not going to spend much more time here. This is a, a clunkier thing to get around in. Um, Sova, which we just saw with Moses Ash collection and Diane and Davies, is set up for archival collections. So it provides you with that hierarchical view. Um, but I will also just add that you can go to the center's website and notice up here at the top, there's folk life, folk ways, and festival. The folk life page, which we're on, has information about the archives and it lists all the different collections I just highlighted some that I thought you might find of interest, but there's a lot of fantastic stuff here. And if you want to explore a collection like the Lee Hayes papers, um, you can go again. I, I showed you this earlier with the with the um, with um, the Ash collection. I think, um, yeah. There we go. So um, I think I'm probably out of time, right? You're actually pretty much on time, Stephanie. So if, you, if you've got something quick to say, then. Um, well, um, I, I was just going to say that um, if anyone has questions, um, uh, and, oh, actually, I was going to also show you just on this page about the archives, there is a section called Using the Archives that provides the contact information for um, the current staff. And, And I am happy if you want to email me, I'm more than happy to help point you in the right direction. Um, and yeah, there's archive staff and, and um, it, you can uh, request copies of materials from the, the center and information about that is down here. Cecilia Peterson has been out on leave, but she should be back this month. And uh, she kind of took over a lot of my responsibilities. Um, so she handles the uh, licensing and permissions. Um, and 
you've got the sheet that Martin sent you. So that provides a lot of these links and what they are. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. That was very, very interesting. We do have time for a couple of questions. If anybody's got a short question, don't forget that you do it by clicking on reactions and raising your hand. Um, the thing I would always advise when I, I, I find the site very, very well organized, um, but it's a big site. So, uh, you know, big catalogs are difficult to get to grips with if you're not used to them. Um, and you just have to be patient. You have to teach yourself how to look for things. And uh, it really does work. It's very impressive, very professional job. Were you actually involved in setting up the catalog? Well, I was very much involved in, in writing grants to get the collections, these large collections, properly processed and then digitized. And the digitized materials exist in a digital asset management system, which I was very involved with. And for instance, the Ralph Rensler papers and audio recordings, it has been mass digitized, but, and the data is in the asset management system, but it, the, the assets apart from, I think one folder have not been connected with the, 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 the finding aid in SOVA. So that's, it, it's slow work. So yeah. I have been one to move along all this and, and focus on getting collections digitized and the Smithsonian really wants people to have full access. Right. Yeah, it's a very long, slow process, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Well, we will move on. Thank you very much, Stephanie. We, we don't have any questions, but everybody can look at the documents that Stephanie um, circulated with the email, giving you the link for this um, for this meeting. So thanks again, Stephanie. We're going to move on to Caroline. So from Washington, D.C., we're now going to Norwich in Norfolk. Uh, East England. Do you want to share your screen, Caroline? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, here goes. <laughs> it's always a worry. Right. I've shared the sound. There we go. Right. Yes, we have that. Right. So is that looking okay? That's looking good. Yes. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> right. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. Anyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So um, this has come up because um, I've been doing a blog, I don't know if some of you know, called uh, Vaughan Williams' Journey into Folk on songs collected by Vaughan Williams between December 1903 and January 1905. And while I've been doing that, I've come across references which suggest that he made or had access to phonograph recordings in the first year of his collecting, which is a bit earlier than uh, might be expected. So I'm just gonna run through some of these things that I've come across. And I, really, I just look forward to hearing what you think about what I found. So to begin with this slide, um, in the British Library, there's a wax cylinder dated 1904-04-04, uh, which that is April the 4th, 1904. And it's also on the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library catalog as seen on this slide. Um, two songs are recorded on the cylinder, Bushes and Briars and Tarry Trousers. And the performer is listed as Mrs. Humphreys from Ingrave, Essex. And the collector is listed as Lucy Broadwood and Ray Vaughan Williams. Uh, Michelle Bernal, and I hope I've pronounced his name right, who's the lead curator of the world and traditional music at the British Library, uh, told me that the engineer who transferred the cylinder 
noted that the speed suggested the recording was more likely to be one of Cecil Sharp's recordings. So there's a bit of a variance there about, you know, who, who recorded it. And the supporting notes that you can see here suggest that the singer could either be Mrs. Humphreys or Lucy Broadwood, and that the recording date given is the date for when Vaughan Williams initially connected the songs from Mrs. Humphrey, so that is with pen and paper, rather than the actual audio recording date. And the reason given for this interpretation is that 1904 was too early for one of Vaughan Williams' cylinder recordings. And the notes suggest the cylinder must date from circa 1908, and goes on to say that the singer could actually be Lucy Broadwood. So there's obviously a lot of questions about the provenance of this wax cylinder. And so in this context of multiple questionings, um, I'm going to add my own two pennies. So we'll see what you think. My first thought is that if we accept that the date was written on the cylinder by the person who recorded it, or by someone else who knew the background to the recording, and unfortunately I haven't been able to see the actual cylinder yet, um, it seems unlikely that they would have written the date when some years previously the songs had been collected on paper. To me, it does anyway. It seems much more probable that they would have written the date of the audio recording. Um, there's also a problem with the idea that the 4th of April 1904 was the date when the songs were first written down, as there's no record of Vaughan Williams or Lucy Broadwood collecting songs in Engrave on the 4th of April 1904. Broadwood was actually staying with relatives in Oxford, Oxfordshire on that day. Um, Vaughan Williams did spend nearly two weeks in Engrave during April 1904, but it was between April the 14th and April the 25th, so a couple of weeks later. He did then collect a number of songs from Mrs Humphreys, but these were on April the 25th. And although he collected Mrs Humphreys' version of Tari Trousers during the visit, there's no record that she sang Bushes and Briars to him. And as you all know, that song was collected from Mr. Potiphar on December the 4th, 1903. So I also have some doubts based on the qualities of the singing on the cylinder, whether the singer could be either Mrs. Humphreys or Lucy Broadwood. So Mrs. Humphreys was a working class woman from rural Essex in her late 60s in 1904, and Lucy Broadwood was a classically trained and accomplished performer. And if I play a little snippet of the recording to you now, I think you'll hear that the voice doesn't seem to fit either of these profiles very well. So here goes, hope you can hear this. It's just 10 seconds of a much longer recording. Come on. <laughs> Okay, did everyone hear that? Yes, we did. Good, good. <laughs> so um, there's a recording of Broadwood singing The Trees They Do Grow High in 1908, which to me sounds like quite a different and rather more professional voice, but I'd be interested to hear what other people think. Um, <clears throat> so my feelings about the catalogue notes on this wax cylinder are that some assumptions have been made about the date of the art artefact because it's not expected that Vaughan Williams could have made a phonograph recording this early in 1904. So the date's been changed because it doesn't fit the accepted narrative. So I'd like to take the given date at face value and explore the idea that Vaughan Williams was using a phonograph at this early stage. And then I'll go on to suggest an idea about who the singer might be. Okay, let's see if this moves on. Yes, it does, good. Um, so this is a page out of one of Vaughan Williams's notebooks um, where he's jotted down a version of Covent Garden sung by Mrs. Verrill, which is dated on the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library catalogue as the 31st of December 1904, um, as you can see here. And you can also see that Vaughan Williams has written phonograph reproductions at the top of the page. 
uh, but there's actually no date written on the page. So it's the catalogue that have dated it that way. I haven't been able to check the actual notebook in the library, but using the online catalogue, it looks like the date is derived from the previous entry on page 395 to 396, which is a song called Tom Block, collected at Gravesend on December the 31st, 1904, from the Trulls. Um, and then there are some blank pages between that entry and the transcripts of Beryl's Covent Garden. And on the next page is a song by Henry Burstow, which uh, Vaughan Williams labels Moorfields. And here's that page. This is also listed in the catalogue as a phonograph transcription dated December the 31st, 1904. And the following page is a pencil sketch for C Symphony, which he was working on in 1903 or 1904. So it could possibly fit with this date, although he didn't call it C Symphony early on. It was called The Ocean, I think. So I have to acknowledge that the blank pages between the December the 31st date for Tom Block and the following transcripts of Covent Garden and Moorfields introduce some uncertainty about the dating, although the catalogue seems perfectly adamant about it. But if the phonograph recordings were made on December the 31st, 1904, um, on the same day as this visit to the Trolls at Gravesend, uh, Vaughan Williams would have had a long day because uh, Verrill and Burstow uh, lived in and near Horsham around 60 miles away from Gravesend. Um, it was probably possible to do such a round trip with deans and things, but it seems unlikely that Vaughan Williams would have done this all on one day, especially as, and this is significant, he had visited Mr. and Mrs. Beryl and Burstow a few days before on December the 22nd, when he collected over 25 songs from them. So this is what I think might have happened. <laughs> I think Vaughan Williams visited the Verrills and Burstow on December the 22nd, 1904, and used a phonograph to record some of the songs. Then Christmas intervened, and then a few days later, he visited the Trolls on December the, 20, uh, December the 31st. And then shortly after that visit, perhaps later that day, he used the same manuscript book to work on some of the material he'd collected via phonograph from the Verrills and Burstow in the previous week. December the 22nd, 1904 was um, the only day where certain he collected material from both the Verrills and Burstow. And so it would make sense that he was transcribing the material on consecutive pages. There's another possible date in November, but the, the actual date of November isn't given. So that's my uh, theory about <laughs> these transcripts. Um, there are some other circumstances which could potentially be seen to undermine this idea. So I'm going to explore those briefly. Burstow's song, Through Moorfields, which is this song, was also included in Broadwood's English Traditional Songs and Carols, published in 1908. And here's a copy of one of the pages of the song as Broadwood published it. So Broadwood noted that the main tune shown is as it was sung by Burstow in 1893, and the variants, um, in those little snippets above, are from a phonograph recording made of Burstow in 1907. And also included in the book is a version of Burstow's Bristol Town, which she notes was also recorded on a phonograph, and this time she specifies it was Vaughan Williams who did the recording. So, you know, that made my little alert start ringing there. So the question is, is our manuscript of Moorfields that we were looking at, in fact, Vaughan Williams' transcript of this 1907 recording? So the first thing to note is that in Broadwood's published version, there are multiple variants throughout eight verses. Um, so you can see on this page, there's several different ones. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Um, on Vaughan Williams' manuscript, there's only one verse available, the last one. So that manuscript we were looking at, there's only one verse. So this raises the question at the outset, if only the last verse was transcribed by Vaughan Williams, where did Broadwood get the, the other variants? <clears throat> so this slide shows a short snippet from Vaughan Williams' manuscript version of Moorfields compared to the tune and variant from Broadwood's published versions, which she says were taken from the 1907 recording. If our Moorfields transcript was taken from the 1907 recording, we should expect the variants 
in Broadwood's version to match it. I hope you're keeping up with this. It's a bit complicated. <laughs> Makes my head go a bit funny. So here I compare one phrase, which is over the words they sent for their parents, which is in the last verse. So the line labeled number one is Burstow's 1893 version. The middle line is Vaughan Williams's Moorfield transcript, which we were looking at, which I transposed into the same key for clarity. And the third line shows a variant taken from the 1907 phonograph recording. So it's three versions of Burstow's singing. In this example, we can see that our Moorfield's transcript does not match the variant shown in Broadwood's version. To start with, in that first little orange box, um, the variant over the words sent for there at the bottom of the box has a grace note, which is not present in Vaughan Williams's version. And in the second box, you can see there's a different interval between the words for and there. In both published versions, so the top and the bottom one, the melody moves from A to G. But in Vaughan Williams's version in the middle, the melody moves from A to F sharp. And in the third box, and I think this is the clincher really, Broadwood doesn't include a variant for the melody over the words parents who. But there is in fact a significant rhythmic difference uh, between the 1893 version and Vaughan Williams's version. So the earlier version has the emphasis on the first syllable of parents, so it's parents with the crotchet on the first syllable, and Vaughan Williams is parents, which sounds a bit funny, but that's what it says, was a crotchet on the second syllable. So if Broadwood was using our Moorfields transcript for the source of variants, you'd think she would surely have included this difference. So these differences, along with other more minor discrepancies and the fact that Vaughan Williams' manuscript only provides the last verse, together makes me think that our Moorfields manuscript that we were looking at is not the one Broadwood was looking at herself, and it was not taken from the 1907 phonographic recording. To add to this, Broadwood clearly states in her publication um, note that it was she who transcribed the 1907 recording of Bristol Town, which was the other Burstow song she used, um, taken from the Vaughan Williams phonographic recordings. So it seems likely that she would have transcribed more fields as well. And as Christopher Behrman points out in the, his 2013 article, I hope I pronounced his name right, the Folk Song Society and the Phonograph. After Vaughan Williams had made the 1907 recordings of Burstow, he lent the phonograph to Broadwood for several days during which she played the recordings to visitors. And I imagine that was when she also transcribed those songs. So after sifting through all this rather detailed material, my conclusion is that our manuscript that we were looking at of Moorfields is not a transcript of the 1907 phonographic recording of Burstow, but of an earlier recording that, as I've already discussed, is likely to have been taken in late 1904 or early in 1905. Um, there are a couple of other things that indicate to me that the phonograph was part of Vaughan Williams's practice early on. Firstly, we know that he lent his own phonograph to Ella Leather in December 1906. In Andrew King's article on the Ella Leather manuscript collection held at the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library, he quotes Leather, who wrote that at that date, late 1906, Broadwood secured for me the invaluable assistance of Dr. Vaughan Williams, who lent an Edison phonograph with recorder and reproducer from which the music could be noted. And as you'll know, he went on to work extensively with Leather, transcribing songs from recordings she made. So if he had a phonograph to lend in December 1906, it follows that he'd been using it before that, so there's no reason to think that the wax cylinder we're investigating has to date from as late as 1908. I don't understand that. And as we've already seen, he was using one again in early 1907, which he then lent to Lucy Broadwood. So he cl clearly thought they were a good idea. The fact that there isn't much evidence of Vaughan Williams' use of the phonograph in the written record or on cylinders doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't doing it. Um, his tutor and mentor, Sir Hubert Parry, first vice president of the Folk Song Society, as you know, said in his inaugural address of 1899, <clears throat> that to his mind, the only way to take down folk songs with absolute accuracy would be to make use of the phonograph. And it shouldn't be surprising that Vaughan Williams would take heed of that suggestion when it became 
practical to do so. Also, we know from other evidence that Vaughan Williams used the phonograph to record Burstow and the Verrills. A grown up son of the Verrills remembered Vaughan Williams and another man visiting his parents with a phonograph when he was a boy. And Burstow famously remembered that he was amazed beyond expression to hear my own songs thus repeated in my own voice. Significantly, although we know this happened, we know he used the phonograph for recording them, Vaughan Williams didn't write phonograph recording on any of the manuscripts collected from Burstow. So I think we have to accept that his use of the phonograph was not always well documented. So my last point on this is a bit more speculative. Um, right at the beginning of his collecting career, on December the 7th, 1903, Vaughan Williams collected eight songs from Henry Burstow. But instead of going to Burstow's house, uh, which in nearly every other, every other case appears to have been his practice, you know, he'd go to people's houses or to the pubs, he brought Burstow to Leith Hill Place, the family home of the Vaughan Williams. And it seems to me that the only good reason for bringing an old man all the way from Horsham to Leith Hill Place in the middle of winter was so that a phonograph could be used to record him. And I think Vaughan Williams was not a Luddite and was perfectly capable of seeing the value of the machines. And he was also wealthy enough to get one when he wanted one. So that's my slightly contentious last point. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's my case for thinking that Vaughan Williams was engaged in the use of phonographs from at least 1904 and probably earlier, and that the wax cylinder with the date of April the 4th, 1904 written on it could quite feasibly have been recorded by him at that time. Although, as I said before, it's not known that he was in Essex on that day, but you know, it's still possible. However, it's also possible that someone else made the recording. And I'm now gonna move on briefly to discuss this idea. Okay, so Vaughan Williams was famously introduced to Charles Potiphar in December 1903 at a tea party, which was organized by two sisters, the Mrs. Heatleys of Ingrave Rectory. Now, it seems to me that the role of one of the sisters, Georgiana Heatley, uh, in starting Vaughan Williams on his collecting quest has been a, a little bit underplayed. So the organized tea was only one of her many activities. Sue Cubbin uh, from the Norfolk Record Office points out in her booklet, This Precious Legacy, that Georgiana Heatley was a member of the local Oxford University Extension Lecture Committee, which uh, chose to invite Vaughan Williams in the first place to give his lectures on the history of folk song at nearby, nearby Brentwood between January and April 1903. And after attending these lectures, Heatley embarked on extensive local research in, uh, into the singers in her area, in the local parishes. And she sent several notes to Vaughan Williams during this period, which he stuck in his scrapbook. So we're just gonna have a quick whiz through some of these. This is the first one, dated March the 13th, 1903, and signed with her initials at the bottom. It's a fragment of the words of Cold Blows the Wind, sung by an old woman living at Stanbourne in Essex about 36 years ago, when she was about 60 or 70 years old. Um, the second note was written a couple of weeks later, listing singers and the songs they could sing. So most of the singers listed, there's Emma Turner, Mrs. Horsnell, school children, sang to Vaughan Williams on the December 1903 visit when he met Mr. Potiphar. Um, uh, this next note um, is part of that, uh, that that's the second bit of that note we just looked at. This note continues with a really interesting remark on how many singers there are in the vicinity. She says, beyond Molden, there is any quantity of singing of old songs at the public houses by men, and the boys pick them up and go on with them. And that's dated April the 1st, 1903. And in an undated note from Heatley in Vaughan Williams scrapbook, she lists the songs that Mrs. Humphreys has sung to her. Tari Trousers is not in there, but there we go. Would have been helpful. And then in this note, uh, which is also undated, but perhaps in preparation for the tea party or for Vaughan Williams' longer visit in 1904, she provides the names and addresses of singers and on how to go and visit them. And on this note, she writes that, I think Mitifer would ask Mrs. Humphreys to come in and then she would sing if the others did. 
after her cold is better. So to me, that Mrs. Humphrey sounds like, you know, quite a shy woman who needs other neighbours around her before she'll sing. So it doesn't seem very likely that she would sing confidently into a phonograph. So if it isn't Mrs. Humphreys and it's not Broadwood, who might the singer be? <clears throat> so Sue Cubbon quotes a report written by the headmistress of the Brentwood School where Vaughan Williams gave the folk song lectures in early 1903. And the headmistress said, the lectures were very much liked and the illustrations sung by different members of the audience proved bright and attractive. So Coven goes on to suggest that Georgiana Heatley may have been one of the singers in the audience because in another of her notes, this one, um, uh, which is the lyrics for Mrs. Humphrey's version of the Golden Glove, um, Heatley wrote that Humphreys knew the tune of this and her grandfather's song, Come Buy Me a Hawk, but she says at the bottom, on the bottom line, I didn't find this out in time to learn them. So this established that Heatley was learning the songs herself, and the implication is that she was learning them in time for an event, such as the lectures. Heatley lived only a five minute walk down the road from Potiphar and Humphreys, and she knew them well as parishioners um, of her father's. It would have been natural to learn the songs from them. And in this context, I think it's reasonable to suggest that the singer on the wax cylinder might be Georgiana Heatley, singing Potiphar's version of Bushes and Briars and Humphrey's version of Tarry Trousers, helped by some unknown person. Perhaps she did it because her two elderly neighbors didn't want to. She was a well-educated, well-to-do woman in her forties who was not a classically trained performer. To me, this profile seems to match the voice we heard on the cylinder much better. So you might ask, how would she have got access to a phonograph? <laughs> well, perhaps the Brentwood Girls' School had one, or perhaps Vaughan Williams lent her his own. He obviously did that a bit. So that's my argument. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what people think. I just wonder, before I stop sharing, do people want to hear the cylinder again, the wax cylinder? to? Or is, yes. shall we just move on? Yes, good idea. Yes, please. Yeah, play it again. Yeah. Um, that means I've got to go scroll. <laughs> Sorry, fiddly. I've given you the reference number there if you want to find it on the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library, the SN number. And um, it's quite interesting you listen to both because you can hear, hear the singer. She sort of, at the end of one, she says, that's it. <laughs> you know, so, I don't know. It doesn't sound like Lucy, Lucy Broadwood to me. Anyway, um, I'll unshare, uh, stop sharing, shall I? And yes, see please. if you've got any questions. That was excellent, thank you. Well, I'm I'm certainly convinced. Whatever it was you came to, whatever decision you come to, I, I'm convinced. <laughs> um, although that the, the, the woman who is singing, the way she pronounces briars, where she rolls the R, yeah, that's that's the only thing that sounds to me sort of middle middle classy, rather mm. than Essex working class maybe. Um, but anyway, we have some questions. Conrad is the first. Keep it short, everybody, please. Conrad? We can't hear I you. I think yet. I'm here. Yeah. Photographs are interesting. My house is full of them. I've been working on them this week. Solar photographs have noise that you can remove through manipulation with modern electronics. I would suggest to try it if it hasn't been done. You can take out that mechanical background there and you might get some more recognizable noise. Yeah. The interesting thing is also, what was the model? Is it, do you know the model of the photograph? 
1909 is early if it's wax uh, uh, cylinders, probably a standard or a home or a gem, maybe. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it says on the uh, entry. Oh, wax cylinder collection. No, I, I don't know. I'm afraid I don't know much about the history of phonographs, um, oh. but it probably says on the British Library entry. Oh, yeah. Library of Congress does work on them. You can take those those error sounds out, and you can look at the model of phonographs. They varied by uh, cost, so you can enter the cost information. That will help some things, and also the quality is is pretty high for a wax cylinder. Yeah. So the, the wax cylinders they get hot and they wear, they mold. But uh, if you could get some of this sound straightened out, I think I think 18, 1909 is pretty early. He only invented the photograph around 19, 1989. So that would be the first home I use, I think standard. So if you look into the mechanism that produced it, you should yeah. be able to get a little closer. Yeah, no, that's really, really useful. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Yeah, show it off. Thank you, Conrad. Derek. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Carolyn. Carolyn and I had a, an exchange of emails a while ago about uh, the Mrs. Humphreys recording. Um, mm -hmm. Some of you uh, might remember that uh, Malcolm Taylor and I produced a CD called A Century of Song in um, 1999. Good, goodness me, over 20 years ago. Um, to mark the centenary of the Folk Song Society, and we included that recording in it. I remember that Malcolm at that stage um, had played it to some of the, uh, it might have been Michael Kennedy, um, I'm not quite sure, um, Michael Kennedy being a great authority on Vaughan Williams. And the view that then was that this wasn't a trained singer singing it, but with um, less access to all sorts of information we didn't actually um you know we took it for granted we, we, we took the um um accepted view that this was mrs humphreys singing it um uh so um so i don't have anything else to say on that except just also to say that um um vaughan williams might have been wealthy enough to buy one and might have been uh, might have recognized their value. But I remember Malcolm talking to Ursula Vaughan Williams about this. Um, and Ursula said um, that he was very technical, um, technically um, uh, not very good with technical stuff. Couldn't even yeah. change, yeah. couldn't even change the batteries on his um, on his hearing aid, for example. So mm. she, I think she was a bit doubtful that he could have managed the technical abilities of using the phonograph. That's not yeah. to say that he wasn't using it in conjunction with someone else who he took with him exactly. to do the technical bits. And yeah. the, the story you said about them going to uh, Leith Hill would um, perhaps um, perhaps uh, support that. I mean, mm. some, somebody recently, I won't mention who it was, but some of you might have seen this on Facebook, sort of saying, you know, why didn't Sharp use the cylinder more? Well, you know, he couldn't get it in the basket of his bicycle, really. You exactly. couldn't trun trundle it along the roads. Um, you know, that were not made up and so on. They're, yeah. they're just rough roads. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I've got to say. Thank no, you very I, much for the talk. That's, thank you. It was your fault that I did it. But <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with you, but of course, Ursula only knew Vaughan Williams when he was old, so she didn't know mm. how ept he was <laughs> yes. um, in his 30s. Um, and also, you know, perhaps that's why he kept lending it. Because he yeah. wasn't that keen on it himself, but he got one and he lent it to other people to facilitate mm. it, you know. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. I think Karen, Caroline's been very modest and not mentioning her book that she's got coming out about Vaughan Williams. So I think you should tell us about that, Caroline, before we move on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, I've got a book coming out about Vaughan Williams. Actually, I've got a copy of it here. This is the Bound Proofs. It's called The Captain's Apprentice. Uh, Ray Fawn Williams and the story of the folk song. It's coming out um, on August 25th, published by Chatham Windus, which I'm very excited about. Um, it's focused around 
his visit to Kings Lynn to collect folk songs there, which is in Norfolk, near where I live. That's what started me getting to be interested in it. And it sort of tells the story of why he ended up in Kings Lynn. So I started to explore his childhood a bit as well. So it's a, a sort of a bit of a biography of Vaughan Williams, but also tracing the story of the song, The Captain's Apprentice, and the story of a, an, a real Captain's Apprentice from Kings Lynn. So it kind of weaves those stories together. So I hope people will enjoy it when it comes out. Yeah, I can recommend it. it at last, there's a book about one of the early collectors that says, you know, they were a good thing rather than they were the devil incarnate, which is what we get most of the time. <laughs> so uh, I can highly recommend it. Thank you, Caroline. That was Thank you. excellent. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, and we're going to move on. Martin's in charge of the next bit because we're going to Padstow and Doc's down there as well. I mean, Martin's in Gloucestershire, but we'll pretend it's Padstow. Hello, I'm here. Um, right. Uh, when we realised that we were um, talking on May the 1st, it seemed only right to uh, recognise what is probably the one day in the English calendar that most of us folkies can agree is quite important, really. Um, lots of people out celebrating, particularly the dancers who have probably been up on some windy wet hill this morning dancing as the sun rose. Um, but perhaps the festival that I've always associated most strongly um, with May the 1st is the Padstow custom. Um, and I myself have been there only twice. Um, first time in the 1970s, pretty early 70s when I was taken down there and a bit quieter then. Then when Sean and I were on our honeymoon, we just happened to be in the area and that was quite a thing to do. My own personal view is it's something for the locals and I don't think we should be intruding too much on the custom. And I think that's one of the problems they've got at the moment that it's become too much of a tourist attraction, both for folkies and for um, the general public who hear about it. Uh, but luckily, we've got Doc down there um, recording the whole thing every year for us. Um, but in 1951, um, Peter Kennedy, uh, together with Alan Lomax, who was probably the chief instigator of the project, went down there with the filmmaker George Picot and uh, um, I've forgotten the name. Um, Anyway, Jean um, Ritchie. Jean Ritchie, thank you. Um, who was his wife at that, or partner at that time. Um, and they made the film that we're about to have a look at, um, which is a bit of a strange animal, um, but a remarkable record of the custom at the time. Um, the two people who appear in it are a London-based narrator, actually uh, Charles Chilton, um, and Charlie Bate, who I knew uh, a little bit when I was living down in the West Country, um, but as a young man was very much uh, part of the custom. So let's have a look at the uh, film. And uh, all I've got to do now is share it and play it. Starts off a bit ropey, doesn't it? But it, it does start the sound. The whole thing hasn't aged ever so well in terms of film quality. This is the best copy that we were able to find. But uh, there we go. That's that's dark now. Sorry, that was, that, was, that was Doc's film. One. Let's try again. No picture. Steve. Yeah. You got no picture. You've got the sound only. 
I wonder what's happened this time. We tested this pretty thoroughly before we, we did. I was there. I saw it. Um, let's uh, just check that. Go back to the beginning. along the keys. Padstow. Down on the Cornish coast. Famous for wrecks and ships gone wrong. Today the arbor is sanded up and the fishing fleet stays home. Here miss, I'd like to see this hobby horse that dances here on the 1st of May. Here, wait. Please come back, young lady. Yeah, scared her. Now what did I say? And then, I twigged this sailor, sitting lazy in the evening sun, playing a strange old melody on his old accordion. You look to be a native son, I hate to interrupt your funny song, but could you tell me about this hobby horse, and how the whole thing's carried on? I'm the secretary of the whole horse party, and I lead the music on May morning. Charlie Bate is my name. Now, I've built this hobby horse in Padstow. Nobody don't seem to know the origin of it. Some people say it's 2,000, 3,000, some say it's 4,000 years old. But we people here in Padstow, in Cornwall, know that it's very old. And we shall make sure that the old Avias comes out into the streets on May Day for a long, long time to come. Now, if you want to see the old Avias come out, come up with me now and see the whole box of tricks. Come on. <laughs> just where I was going or who I was going to meet, but I followed my strange conductor along the old and narrow streets, for I'd heard that this Padstow dance dated back to pagan times, a, a sexy, savage springtime ride. <laughs> but I hadn't a clue what I'd find. Come on in and meet the boys. They're sort of warming up for May Day. expect to see this sort of dancing in Cornwall. Real good stuff, isn't it? Come on, over and have a drink. Hey, Charlie, where's this army horse? Well, it's right in front of your nose. Those two lads will both be playing the horse tomorrow. Waiting for the hours to roll by, waiting for the old town clock to strike the hour of midnight. Now this here old cult, so the scholars say, was one of our religions when we lived in caves. I can't say whether it's druidic or neolithic, but you've got to admit this Padstow Oss dance is pretty terrific.
And I don't expect anybody that's in the crowd now can remember the old ass coming out without him. But he's, but he's here again today, though he's sitting at the back of the golden lion in his bath chair. But he's come down specially to see that the arse is brought out correctly. And that reminds me that in about 80 years ago, some of the most influential people in Padstow did everything possible to prevent the old arse being brought out. But a few faithful ones, and old Mac, he did it at the risk of losing their jobs. The old ass came out, and it's out again this year. So, all together, give three hearty cheers for Mac and the old ass. Ass ass! We are! Ass ass! We are! Ass ass! We are! He's 84 now, and his dancing days are over. And he's handing the club over to his little grandson, Willie. And believe you me, little Willie is a grand dancer. take this additional route. Turn left, outside of the Golden Man, we go up Church Lane. Go right up Place Hill, then down to Oak Terrace. Well, there, in Oak Terrace, lived Mr. William. He was a real old male, but he's a bit old now. He don't have much to do with it. feel right at all all the year. If the horse didn't come and visit him on May morning, they'd kind of feel neglected. Unite and unite and let us all unite, for summer is the coming today. And whither we are going, we all will unite in the merry morning of May. He's laid down and died, old dear. He's laid down and died. Oh, where is King George? Oh, where is he? He's out in his longboat, all on the salt seal. Up flies the kite, down falls the larko. And Ursula Burgood, she had an old yacht, and it died in her old parko. The thump of that club is a springtime sound that brings the crops up out of the ground. The whole sleeps up and so does the brain. And the old fox feel like young again. Where are the maidens that here now should sing for? Summer is a common today. They are in the meadows, the flowers gathering in the merry morning of May. Arise up, Miss Margaret, all in your gown of silk, for summer is a common today. And all your body under as white as any milk in the merry morning of May. By this time, mind you, the crowd's down in the market, and we have a real good dance around the bay. Watch Margaret there. She's a real Padstonian. This happened to Margaret's mother, and it's 
has got to happen to Margaret. She has got to go into the old house of skirt. Look out, Margaret! <laughs> In the old days, the horse was covered with tar. And if a girl got the tar smudge on her, they did say that that meant the girl would be married by Christmas. And I took that horse from 10 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the evening without a bridge. But I'm very sorry to say I can't do it now. But all the same, I got my sons here who follow their father's footsteps. I must say, sir, when I'm gone west, I hope the horse will come down on my graveyard and dance over it. Now we fare you well and bid you all good cheer, for summer is a common today. We'll fall no more unto your house before another year, in the merry morning in May. Okay, well, let's just have a look at uh, another piece of film that uh, came from the remarkable Doc Rowe, um, who knows far more about this custom than any of us. And maybe we can get him to say a couple of things after we've just watched this little bit of video. So try sharing again. Let's see if I can get the right one this time. Thank you. 
Still gives me goosebumps, you know, every time I see that when it takes me right back. The sound of the drums, it's wonderful. Doc, are you happen to be there? I happen to be there, yeah. I'm yeah, I'm goosebumped all over. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, we were out in the square last night at midnight with the uh, blue ribbon os. I mean that was the thing in the uh Lomax film, of course, you only saw the old os. Um uh and um I mean, I did interview Alan Lomax uh, a great length about the film. He was very, very shy and very um, angry in a way that it, all the all the attribution had been to Peter Kennedy. He, he felt that he was more involved. But what was remarkable, his um, his um, his recall, his memory of individuals was fantastic. So he was naming. I so we looked looked at that film together, and. Um, he, he was able to name all the individuals in that film, you know, many of whom I, of course, know in, in, in later years. Uh, it was great. But yeah, anyway, you saw the blue ribbon and the, the, the old os there, not the red and the blue, as people do call it. Well, thank you very much, Doc. And uh, okay. happy... well, of course, tonight with midnight, we start, um, although it's the May the 1st today, and it's already happened. We, we they moves on to the uh, moves past the Sunday. So you saw that wonderful, very emotional moment where all the local people come together outside the Golden Line at the strike of midnight. Incidentally, you never hear the town clock; it's too far away. Um, so digital watches come into play these days, and um, the, we sing to householders by name. And in the early 60s, when I first went round, I mean, it was two or three hours in Padstow itself. Nowadays, there's only five or seven people actually living in Padstow. So we now go off to the housing estate nearby and finish up about four or five in the morning. Um, and drink is taken, I have to say. <laughs> well, I hope you have a good time, Doc, and we'll see you when you good. come back in one piece, no doubt. I have put into the chat a link to another a YouTube video, a very short one of uh, the custom from 1932, which is another interesting contrast. You can see how everything has grown since 1951. Things have evolved, which, of course, is what that evolution is, what Doc's work is about. Um, but in 1932, it was a much gentler event by the look of it. Um, shall we take any questions, Steve? Yeah, can do, although we'll keep it brief because we're, we're over time already. Anybody got a question? Conrad? Conrad has his hand up. One friend of mine looked at a video like that and he said, I bet nobody leaves a restaurant without the tip. <laughs> 
had the pedestal horses come come after them. <laughs> the other tradition of this day is similar. Uh, in Hastings, they do Jack in the Green. That is a London urban tradition, which goes with the chimney sweeps. But it's, it's tomorrow is the culmination on the big hill overlooking the sea. It's a wonderful, wonderful event. Thousands of people. And it's, it's very similar to Pat's stuff. But rather more modern. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's not as old. Yeah. And that's not forgetting the minehead hobby horse as well, the old sailor's horse. I mean, if there's, if there's anything up to four or five horses coming out there, but that starts at five o'clock in the morning on May Day morning, and they're already out. So, I mean, there are there are dozens. I mean, more than dozens of events that are happening all oh, over. Sure. Yep. And also, of course, events on the continent as well. Uh, sorry, yeah. the uh, European continent. <laughs> where you will find similar things going on. Anyway, thank you very much. They've got a couple of giants now turn up. Yeah. That's so, French. Okay, let's uh, start winding up. Thank you very much to the doc um, at, Steve, and the people of Padstow. Caroline, did you still want to Steve, say something? Can I just, there was a couple of questions in the chat to oh, me. Oh, right, I haven't got the chat. For, um, just, do you mind if I just quickly answer them? Yeah, sure. Yes. Really quickly. Yeah, please. Uh, Simon Fury. Yeah, Simon Fury asked about um, whether I'd looked at the idea of the transcripts, Vaughan Williams transcripts being. Um, I'm trying to find the question here. What he actually said. Um, whether they were um, retranscribed from uh, rewrites of his scruffy field notes, and. I probably whizzed through the slide too quickly, but it, he actually wrote phonographic transcriptions at the top of that. I can't see where Simon is, but he actually wrote phonographic transcription at the top of the page. So that's pretty certain that, that that's what it was. That's a clue. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, probably didn't have a look at that for long enough to remember that. And then Derek was saying that um, he needs a copy of the book to review it. And Derek, wherever you are, I'll make sure one gets sent to you. That's it. I can't see you on the screen. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably the best way. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Caroline and and Stephanie for your contributions. And of course, as I said, Doc and the people of Padstow. We'll be back with you in a fortnight's time, uh, which is fifteenth of May. Um, we've got at least two, maybe three papers. One, um, Kira Thompson's going to carry on with her talk on lullabies. Last time she didn't have time to play the Irish lullabies that she wanted to play, so this time we'll get to those. Paul Cowdell is going to talk about a particular song called The Farmers of Old England and his work on that. Um, so I hope we'll see you all again in a fortnight's time. Goodbye, fairly well. Thanks for coming.